Gut, da waren es nur noch zwei. Ähm. Na, jetzt mal wieder rein. So, now the main reason why we're discussing all of this and later on also random field theory because these kind of statistical test procedures are performed routinely over um, many voxels inducing a multiple testing um, problem or at least a multiple testing scenario uh, in which yeah, different considerations regarding controlling the test error probabilities have to be respected and um, before they can be respected they actually have to be developed and um, thought of. So the um, Basic assumption is again the same, so we uh, have a parametric statistical model that depends on some parameter and uh, that creates some data. Um, now the data um, that we um, have in mind, especially for fMRI, would include um, not only one spatial location. Yeah? So the Y that we are now talking about is um, not necessarily the um, time series of a single voxel anymore, but the time series of many voxels. So for example, three. So you can think of if we had our small y being um, the time series that we now have, for example, three of them next to each other. Um, a typical thing in fMRI second level analysis is that um, you um, do um, um, a mass univariate analysis on the first level, so at the participant level, and then you form some contrasts. And then for a given participant in voxel, uh, you um, get some uh, contrast value. Let's, uh, let's for example, uh, or, or let's do it like this, yij. So that's um, I um, to n participants and uh, j uh, one to m voxels. Um, you uh, use the better estimate of um, the given participant and uh, the given voxel. Yeah. So remember that we uh, evaluated um, the better parameters always for a single uh, time series, so which was for a single voxel, for a single participant, and now we just make that explicit that it's a yj. And um, then this better, of course, um, depends on its dimensionality and how many conditions there are. But if you uh, use um, a contrast weight vector, so for example, by um, um, yeah, just selecting one of the p better values or by computing a difference between the first and second better or something for this voxel, for this participant, uh, you will get um, a single value. And then the data that uh, is often used in second level analysis and fMRI data would um, be of um, the form y, um, which then goes for the first participant over voxels, so y1 number of voxels, and this for um, all your participants, so I called them m already, m, and this would be participant n, and the first voxel and participant n and the nth voxel. So this would be then um, a data set that we have in mind now, because um, you can have multiple testing scenarios in all kinds of uh, cases, but for fMRI, that's what we are thinking of. So where you have um, now here as a row effect with your own participants, and here you have Voxels, or if you have a single participant, you still have uh, time points and uh, voxels, but definitely you now take the spatial thing into account. This is where the multiple testing comes up. 
we will look at this again when we uh, write down the GLM that we're actually applying random field theory uh, to here. So this is just as a uh, yeah, as a little example at this point to motivate that we look at multiple hypotheses. Um, and um, then the um, assumption is again that theta is part of a um, parameter space. But now in the multiple testing scenario, we evaluate multiple test hypotheses. And um, we do this, um, we assume that we have m hypothesis, which of course here was also the number of voxels, which was uh, on the purpose. Um, and each hypothesis is again a partitioning of parameter space into two disjoint subsets, which now they look very much like in the uh, single test scenario, and now they get this little i index. Um, so again, the parameter space is um, made up of these uh, two subsets and the intersection of these two subsets is the empty set. So again, they are a partition. And um, this i is an element of um, an index set. And this index set is just the natural numbers from 1 to n. Um, and then uh, we, um, based on this, can of course um, make uh, m different uh, statements about the true but unknown parameter, namely theta in theta zero i, um, which we um, call the i null hypothesis. Theta in theta one, which is the ith alternative. So to make this slightly concrete with respect to um, voxels and so on, um, think uh, about the following um, example that um, we I'm going to do that actually we don't want to use matrix variants um, so somewhat intuitively uh, think that um, we have um, one voxel where the data is distributed according to a normal distribution with uh, um, expectation parameter um, mu one and variance parameter sigma square. Um, so um, this could be then, for example, the distribution of these uh, contrasted better weights, so single numbers. Yeah? So if we sample here, we can sample, for example, um, 10 data points which are distributed according to, which are independently and identically distributed according to um, this uh, univariate Gaussian. And the same thing we assume for a second voxel. Or whatever that is, and a third box. Now the parameter space of um, this model, when we think about um, the um, entire um, um, the entire model, is um, so each the the parameter vector. Can you close the door, please? Thanks. Uh, the parameter vector here would um, be mu1, mu2, and mu3. And we assume we know the variance uh, um, 
to read. Um, we assume we know the variance parameters, so we don't uh, care about this. So the parameter vector would be um, um, v1, v2, v3, because we can vary each of these expectation uh, vectors. And this, of course, would be um, in parameter space, which is um, three-dimensional space. The question is now, what are three different um, null hypotheses um, uh, and uh, um, respective alternative hypotheses that we can can came up, can come up with in this scenario, and this uh, could look like uh, fo uh, could look as follows. So theta one zero. So the first null hypothesis could be those uh, mu uh, mu in R three for which mu1 equals zero. Yeah. And then the first uh, alternative hypothesis would be um, R3 without mu0, one. Second, um, so this would basically just constrain um, the, um, the first expectation parameter, so this one to be zero, and basically say nothing about the other ones. But of course, if we um, do, for example, a voxel-wise test, and we test at this location, um, so at the first voxel, then um, we also um, just test the null hypothesis there and don't do anything else, so we don't hypothesize anything about um, what's going on on the other voxels. Second um, null hypothesis then could, of course, and that's relatively clear, could be mu2 equals 0. And again, the alternative being um, R3 without this. And then clearly the third, a third null hypothesis uh, could be mu three for which three equals zero and mu one three. So what this is little example here um, is supposed to uh, tell you is that um, this idea of testing again and again over voxels uh, can be translated into this idea of partitioning the parameter space again and again by always constraining um, or basically defining the null hypothesis um, to be that subset of parameter space for which the important parameters for this voxel are zero, for example, and, um, and everything else. Yeah? So that's kind of how this testing voxel by voxel uh, or simultaneously testing many voxels uh, can be translated into this idea of um, partitioning the parameter space again and again. Yeah? Questions about this? Because this is a little bit important so that you have an idea what this um, uh, multiple test hypothesis relates to. Good. Apparently no questions. Um, these uh, together, these um, multiple hypotheses are sometimes then also called a, um, yeah, a family of hypotheses um, or hypothesis family. And this, of course, then also relates to this uh, notion of a family wise error rate, how we will see, but at least the name family comes up. Good. Um, so that's just the test scenario. So we have now, we partition the parameter space m times. And um, so for each partitioning, there's one null hypothesis and one alternative hypothesis, and they have um, the theta 0 and theta 1 with the respective index. Now, if we talk, um, if we want to talk about um, errors, um, we it's a little bit more complex than in the case that um, 
uh, of a single test uh, um, in a single test because in the single test we can have um, that theta um, is in the null hypothesis um, and um, we can have in the case um, that all yeah, again in the single test now we have this or theta is in uh, theta one but now we can um, in the um, a multiple testing scenario, um, theta can um, essentially be, um, or um, it's better, I think it's better to explain it like this, the null hypothesis can actually hold at one location only. Um, so theta is, um, for example, in um, theta zero one from our given example and theta is not in um, big theta zero two and also not uh, three so that would be the case that um, if you look at our example that um, the true but unknown uh, parameter actually has this uh, form so there's a zero here and um, here there's just any value but of course, we can also uh, have the case that um, the true but unknown parameter is in both the first and the second null hypothesis, yeah? so that the null hypothesis holds at two voxels and so on. So um, to distinguish these cases, um, one needs to be a little bit more careful, and uh, that's what I want to then draw now. Oh, don't know. Um, so we have to think about three cases. The first case is all null hypotheses are true. Um, and hence all alternatives false. And then we have the case that some null hypotheses are true. And the remaining alternatives are true. So it if only some null hypotheses are true and some are not true, then in those where the null hypothesis is not true, then there's the, the alternative is, is true and uh, all alternative hypotheses are true. Which also implies that all all zero or null faults. And um, these um, I refer to as, um, so this is what this is supposed to mean. Maybe, maybe before I um, make this more technical again in terms of uh, fMRI data analysis. So here if we have uh, voxel locations, um, then we can uh, have, of course, the case that um, this is our mu1, mu2, mu3, mu4, mu5, mu6. We can have uh, the case, for example, that mu1, if we only if we consider the uh, null hypothesis equivalent to the nil hypothesis, so that this value is zero, then mu e, mu i can be zero for i from one to six. So this would be uh, all null hypotheses are true. We can have, for example, mu one, uh, mu two, and mu six equals zero. And um, the remaining mu three, mu four, 
maybe they are even different. That's actually a hard constraint, so let's do that. Mu3, mu4, and mu5 are not zero. And then we can have uh, the case that all of them are not zero. And to be zero here means that the null hypothesis holds. Yeah. So these are just the scenarios that we can have. So um, even less formal, we can just say um, there can be true activation um, everywhere in the brain. That would be um, the complete alternative. There can be no activation anywhere in the brain. This would be the complete null hypothesis. Or there could be uh, activation at certain parts of the brain, but not in others. This would be a partial um, alternative uh, hypothesis. And um, formally, um, we would write this as follows. So let's first start with a complete null. Um, we would write theta n theta zero, which we define as the intersection of Um, all null hypotheses. Um, yeah, that's the complete null hypothesis. So again, if you think about our case where um, with the three things, so that um, you have uh, theta one zero. Um, are the for which the first is zero and we don't say anything else. Um, there's the second, which are the three dimensional real vectors for which the second is zero and we don't say anything else. Um, and for which the Third is zero. If we now think about the intersection of uh, these three sets, so if we think about theta zero, which we define as theta one zero and theta two zero and theta three zero, and we think about which mu's actually uh, do that, the, so that needs to be a mu for which the first uh, um, entry is zero. It also needs to be uh, a mu for which the second entry is zero and for which the third, third is zero. So this would be um, actually only, so this set would be the mu's that have all zeros. So that, what I'm trying to say here is, or show you is that um, this talking about sets and intersections of sets, um, if you translate it into what the parameters are under these constraints that null hypothesis corresponds to that the parameter is zero, then this is kind of natural because um, the intersection of all these null hypotheses in this setting would mean that uh, all the parameters for all the voxels are zero. Uh, it's just that um, this notation is um, more general than to always make it explicit in terms of um, a given parameter. So that's the complete null hypothesis. Then, of course, we can define the complete alternative hypothesis. Um, that would be um, that the intersection of all theta i1, I now don't uh, do such an example, so that's complete alternative. So that would be the case that the null hypothesis holds nowhere. And both of these cases from in terms of brain imaging are not that interesting, right? So the complete null hypothesis that you have, although, um, well, uh, the complete null hypothesis is actually something um, that is dealt with um, quite, uh, quite often in, in neuroimaging. Um, but I think it's a little bit... Uh, so to test against the assumption that nothing happens, that's 
especially if you talk about power that's quite strong complete alternative hypothesis that the whole brain is activated is also not a very natural hypothesis from my perspective a natural hypothesis for which we then compute power in our power paper is actually the partial alternative hypothesis but that's more regarding power which we are not discussing here partial alternative hypothesis um, where theta is in the intersection of all i in some subset i1 of i um, of the alternative hypothesis um, where i1 is a subset of i yeah so if i is 1 to 10 because there are 10 things then for example i1 is 1 2 6 7 9 yeah, it's just a subset and um, we define m1 as the number of true alternative hypotheses so that's the cardinality of this uh, set and um, then if we define this as the partial alternative uh, um, hypothesis then of course there's also the uh, partial null hypothesis um, so again, the, therefore, we would have a subset of i for which the alternative, uh, sorry, the null hypothesis holds. And uh, here we have now i0, which is defined as our set of um, enumerated hypotheses without i1. And uh, the um, cardinality of this set would be m minus m1 and we call this m0 yeah, so this partial alternative hypothesis scenario is quite important because we will uh, then when we talk about error rates we will need this so again in terms of these uh, easiest I think it's to think in terms of the sets so these are the i is the um, hypothesis index set And if we test, for example, 10 hypotheses, then I would just be 1, 2, and let's say we uh, just use M instead of 10. So that's all, for example, our number of voxels. Then I0 is um, the um, null hypothesis index set. So that is then a subset of this. So for example, yeah, I don't know, uh, two, seven, and some others up to M0. And then we have I1, which is our alternative hypothesis set. which is then um, everything in I except the things that are in I0. Yeah. Good. That's the scenario, and it, of course it's a little bit more involved um, than in the single test scenario that you're familiar with. So in the single test scenario, either the null hypothesis holds or the alternative hypothesis holds. Easy. easy. Now, if you have multiple hypotheses, then the null hypothesis can hold in all of these hypothesis scenarios, or yeah, all these test hypothesis scenarios, in some of them, or in none of them. And that's basically just what is formalized here. Yeah. Questions? Not right now. So then the next thing would be, what is then a multiple test? So this is again, so far we've basically established the multiple test scenario uh, extension of a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. Now we want to go from a single test to a multiple test. 
So for multiple tests, we first again um, consider uh, a single test. Yeah. So we now think of a single test phi i, which, which takes an n-dimensional data set and maps it on to the set 0, 1. So it takes a data vector and maps it to 0, so on to 0, 1. So that's, if you want, the i test. So if we have um, 10 voxels and we do a test on the first voxel, this test that we do on the first voxel, there we have n data points, maybe from n subjects, or if we are at the, single, at the first level for participants, then we have these 400 data points. And for this voxel, we then reject or don't reject the null hypothesis. So we have a test. And um, it's a single test. It's a test like we uh, have seen it in the single test scenario. But now um, we um, talk about a multiple test. And by a multiple test, which I denote here by a big phi, um, we mean a mapping from an uh, oops. I should debate this actually from an n m dimensional data set. Although you could also call this n-dimensional data set if you haven't specified what's going on here. But let's say we have, um, for each of the tests, we have the same number of data points. So then it's an n-m-dimensional data set, as you, we've seen these matrices before. To the m times Cartesian product of uh, 0 and 1. So the data set gets mapped to phi, big phi, y, and this is defined, and that's not an important point, as a vector of single tests that all operate on the data like this. So to make this uh, a bit more concrete, or what, what you really should uh, take from this is that the outcome of a single test of phi, y, if we apply this to data, um, we get this, or we get phi y this. The outcome of a multiple test, for example, for um, three locations, is the outcome of one single test, the outcome of a second single test, and the outcome of a third single test. And each of these tests can come out 0 or 1. Yeah? So one possible outcome is that the first test comes out 0, the second out comes one, uh, test comes out 1, and the third test also comes out 1. Yeah? So you should, in terms of this multiple tests, in terms of the outcome of a multiple test, it's a vector of zeros and 1s. Um, where it's yeah somewhat random uh, where there's a zero or a one yeah so because each test uh, can individually come out zero and one yeah so if you think think about an fmi um, data set and there are all these voxels um, so you have this and then you have um, the voxel grid over it and um, then at each voxel you perform a test then that means that essentially at each location you put in a 1 or a 0 um, and that's the outcome of your multiple test and your multiple test contains all of these things. Let's see when I can fill them all reasonable time. Yeah, and if you vectorize uh, this uh, matrix then you have the outcome of a multiple test. Um, again, we will assume um, basically that for each of these individual tests uh, that they are of um, the form that we've seen before, so essentially that they are um, critical value based. So we um, have a test statistic for all of them. Yeah, that's, uh, so. Um, so we basically make the assumption that the uh, standard test that we established 
previously that they um, are also forming this multiple test. So we have a test statistic for all of them. And um, we choose um, or can potentially choose uh, critical values for each of these tests. So each of these uh, tests in the uh, multiple test can have potentially a different critical value. So that's the general case. We will later see that um, it's for certain reasons a good idea to choose a common critical value if we want to establish some error control. But in principle, we could, for example, have a critical value at this uh, location that is different from this location. It still would be a test. Yeah? Um, but um, we assume that we uh, evaluate test statistics and um, based on test statistics, um, evaluate our decision rule. And again, we would for each test then have a rejection region, um, namely that the um, test statistic at the ith location um, y, um, such that the test rejects the null hypothesis. So this is just the this is just the generalization of the um, rejection region of a single test to the rejection region of a single uh, test still, but in the context of a multiple test. Yeah. Um, yeah, in principle, this multiple test scenario is relatively simple. So you have, um, you just need to view simultaneous testing of uh, all the different voxels, not as like a sequential procedure or something like that, but as simultaneously evaluating um, this vector of multiple uh, single tests. Yeah? That's a multiple test. Good. How much time do we have? A little bit, but not really. Um, no, I think it would be rushed. Um, so, now, basically, I can briefly point to what will then happen is that um, we now have two uh, things. So we have our hypothesis scenario. Where um, we can have full, well, no, complete, that's what I call it, complete null. Complete alternative and partial alternative. So that's the true state. So either the null hypothesis holds everywhere, nowhere, or somewhere, and not somewhere else. And we have the test outcome scenario. which scenario, which now is of course not just uh, phi y equals zero or phi y equals one, as it was in the single test scenario, but now we can have phi y equals zero, 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 or zero, one, zero, or all of them, and so on. So it, it gets um, much, uh, and uh, and then the question is, um, yeah. And then the question is, what you call an error or not? So, for example, if, you, if the complete null hypothesis holds, then this would not be an error, um, and this would be an error, and this would be an error. So here you could say, okay, these two are errors. This is not an error. Under the complete alternative hypothesis, this would be an error. This would be an error. This would not be an error. And the partial alternative hypothesis, um, this would be an error, this would be an error, and this would be uh, likely incorrect. So you have m many more uh, possibilities for defining errors um, than in the single test scenario. And there are different error rates uh, for uh, um, type 1 errors. Um, one, so for example, there are the uh, pair comparison rate, the false discovery rate, the penalty rate, and the penalized error rate. And um, then in imaging, 
and often in these multiple testing scenarios, one error rate is uh, chosen, and in, uh, in imaging is determined this error rate, and which then can be controlled by maximum statistics. But this is, I think, where I want to then um, again start next time to really get the motivation for the maximum statistic clear because. It doesn't help if I tell you about all the characteristics if you don't really understand why we need the maximum statistic distribution. So um, then next time, multiple test error probabilities and maximum uh, statistic. And I think um, this will only take one hour and then we can start with the one field study. Questions? <laughs> Um, so maybe it's for that. I don't want to think about here. Um, X, um, uh, yeah, no. Yeah, no. Here, um, when I use this mu, I was thinking about um, um, a single better value. So when I um, um, introduce, where did I write this? Here, um, this here. Um, what I meant is that uh, you have um, at the third location you make n observations. So what I, you could also write uh, is that the probability distribution about y three is again a vector um, with one n mu three and sigma square i n. So I meant this here in an iid sense. So that you sample repeatedly from uh, that, and so you repeatedly sample from a univariate uh, Gaussian distribution where your parameter is a scalar value, which is the same as uh, sampling um, once from a multivariate Gaussian, where again your um, mu value is a scalar value, but it needs to be multiplicated with this vector of once to um, create multiple data points. Yeah. Um, but I wanted here to, um, in this example, uh, to be mu, to be scalar, to be then able to um, uh, introduce this multiple, um, uh, these multiple hypotheses and then the complete null hypothesis where they intersect. So that means that each individual scalar mu i is zero so that the vector of mu's over voxels then is zero, zero, zero. Yeah. Good. Then see you next week.